All right, so we've had our first look at constructing a Punnett square and figuring things out from it, and later the Punnett square problems are going to get a little more complex, so before they do, let's see if we can get a procedure down that covers everything we do when we're working a Punnett square problem. These are the steps that you should be hearing in class, and they're, they're good ones, I recommend them too. These are all the things that you have to work through to get a Punnett square problem done, and Basically, each of these steps unlocks the ones after it. You really have to do these things in this order, or you're going to have, you're going to need a miracle to get through one of these. So let's go through these and see if I followed them all when I did my example. And good news, I skipped the first step. Because we had been talking about eye colors for quite a while before we did this problem, I did not actually write out a legend, and I should have. So let's get that fixed right now. By a legend, we mean when you're using code like Big B and Little B, you should explain what each of those means. And while I technically had done that when we were talking about the blue-eyed and brown-eyed people, let's do it formally here. So, Big B is the brown eye allele, and Little B is the blue-eyed allele. And a really good legend covers not only the separate alleles, but the genotypes for all the possible people, so it would cover that Big B, Big B is brown eyes, that Big B, Little B is also brown eyes, and that Little B, Little B is blue eyes. That's a good legend. Your teacher might be okay with just this, but I think a good legend has all this stuff. It, you do the alleles individually, and then you show all the ways that they can combine. So, after that, Figure out the parents' genotypes. In this case, we had followed these kids. We, we, had, we had met their parents who were little b, little b, and big b, big b, and so we knew that they were heterozygous. In some questions, we are not... That isn't completely obvious, and it might take a little thinking to work out the parents' genotypes, but in this case, we knew they were big b, big b, in both cases, the mom and the dad. So we had that covered. There's our legend. There's our genotypes. Next step is draw a Punnett square and put the parents' gametes on the side of it. So here's where we set up our Punnett square. On the edges we put the possible sperm cells that could come from dad. He could pass on to big B or little b. And the possible egg cells that could come from mom. So that part was easy enough. Step four was combining the gametes. And that's where we went through and said, okay, this kid got big B from dad, big B from mom. That tells us what their genotype is. And we did that for each combination. Here was big B from dad, little b from mom, little b from dad, big B from mom, and little b's from both. We got all those genotypes worked out. And once we had genotypes, thanks to our legend, we could get the phenotypes pretty easily. Big B, big B, brown eyes, big B, little b, brown eyes, brown eyes again, and blue eyes there. So. By the end of step four, you have your entire Punnett square filled in, and then step five is just counting up all the outcomes and seeing how often they happened. And in this case, we found brown eyes happened three times, whereas blue eyes only happened once. That gives us one of our ratios. And for genotypes, we get big B, big B once, big B, little b twice, and little b, little b once. That's our ratio of one to two to one. Good. So let's try some practice problems, and let's see if these steps work. Now before we get into these, or actually I guess this goes in with the legend part, they're using a new trait now. I started out talking about eye color because everyone understands that, but in this case they've switched and they are now talking about pea plants as kind of a reference to Gregor Mendel's famous work, where they found that in pea plants, there are two ways the peas can come out. They can be round, they can be an almost perfect ball, or they can come out of the plant already all looking wrinkled and scrunched. That doesn't mean the peas dried out. Some plants just produce this kind of pea naturally, and even when they're as fresh as can be, they already have that wrinkled shape. And Gregor Mendel found that the round pea plants are the dominant ones, dominant, and wrinkled peas are a recessive trait. So we have to have a code for this. 
and because round starts with R, we generally use capital R for the dominant round P's. And then we use the lowercase version of that, meaning little r for wrinkled p's. So the dominant trait is the one that determines what the letter is going to be. Here we went round, so it's r, even though r doesn't make a lot of sense for the word wrinkled. It's Sorry, you're the recessive version. You just get to follow along with whatever this is. If you have a tall p plant, you might use capital T, and then short plants get lowercase t, just because it's the lowercase version of t for tall. So, there's the first part of our legend, and the other part of our legend will be how do these combine when we have an actual plant. If a plant is big R, big R, then it would be, it would produce round peas. If it's little r, little r, it'll produce wrinkly peas. And what happens if it's this? Big R is dominant, big R is round, so here you get round peas again. So. Both of these plants will be indistinguishable just looking at their looking at their peas because they'll be round either way. They can be genetically different but still produce the same thing. So there is our legend. I'll scoot that off to the side. And there we go. Okay, legend done. Now, we need parents' genotypes according to this. And in the question, they say... A homozygous round plant, okay, well round is big R, and homozygous means two of the same, so the round homozygous round plant is big R, big R, is crossed with, in biology we normally just put an X here to mean produced offspring with, a homozygous recessive plant. Recessive is the little r, and homozygous means two of them, so little r, little r. This is our cross. Those are the two parents, and that's all we need for step two. We've got our legend, we've got parents' genotypes. Step three is set up a Punnett square. And put the parents' gametes on either side of it. So if this is the mother plant, it only has the dominant allele, big R, so that's all it can possibly pass on. It's going to produce big R, and that's the only possibility. You're going to get big R, or you'll get the other big R. It doesn't make much difference. If this is the father plant, all it can pass on is little r's. Now, if you're thinking this Punnett square is too big, you're right, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, but for now I'm going to do this with the basic square just because this is what we've been practicing so far. So when we do these combinations, this offspring gets big R from one parent, little r from the other one. Big R, little r. Over here, big R, little r. From this parent, big R, little r. I'm always putting the capital letter first, no matter which parent it came from. And here, big R, little r. That was a little repetitive. Big R, little r, according to our legend, is a round plant. Right, The dominant allele makes it round, so we get round, round again, round again, round again. So when it comes to doing the ratios, well, all of these offspring are the exact same. It's going to be like 100% round for the phenotype, and it's going to be 100% uh, big R, big R, big R, little r, or heterozygous for the genotype. There is no variety in the offspring here, which is a little bit lame, but it's a warm-up question, so sometimes that happens. So there's our offspring. If it bugged you that this was the same entry repeated over and over again, that's fair, and let's look at that now. We could have made this simpler. When you see that one of the parents can only produce one kind of gamete, there's really no, re no need to write it twice. And so we could have, I could have done a much simpler Punnett square, ridiculously simple Punnett square, which would go like this. This parent can only produce big R's, so I'm just going to write a big R once. That's the only thing that you're going to get from this parent. 
This parent can only produce little r's. And now, we, I mean, we still get a Punnett square. It's just it's one by one now instead of me having to write the same thing four times. Let's say the only offspring these two can possibly produce is a big R, little r, round peed plant. So do this if you're comfortable with it. It certainly saves time in writing. But do this if if this freaks you out a little bit, then by all means stay with this version. It will give you the right results. It'll just take a little bit longer. So those are the genotypes and the phenotypic ratio for the... Have you heard this term before? I haven't mentioned it yet. I think it comes up pretty early in the lectures, but let's make sure we get that down. When we're talking about several generations, and we've already had examples that had grandparents and parents and kids, geneticists need a consistent way to name those, and what they go with is the first generation that starts off everything is called the P generation, as in the parents. And the kids that they have, from the Latin word fili, which means sons, they call the F1 generation. That's the children of the parent generation. Oops, sorry. I do know how to spell generation, and I will prove it in just a second. And if they have kids, we call them the F2 generation. F3, F4, F5. You can stack up as many filial generations as you want to cover everyone that's in your problem. If there's a generation before the P, then you've made a mistake. The first generation should be your P, and everyone after them gets an F number. So you're, there isn't notation for anything before the P unless you call it like P minus 1. I don't think I've ever seen that. So the senior generation should be the parental generation, and then it's filial generations after that. So here, these parents that we started the problem with are our P generation, and the offspring that we worked out here are what we call the F1 generation. And that matters because in the next part of this question, we take these and cross them, and we're going to get grandchildren, the F2 generation. So let's see what happens with them now. They say two F1 offspring were crossed. So these pea plants produced a generation of plants that were all big R, little r. And two of those plants, if they're growing side by side, will cross with each other, and then we'll get an F2 generation. So this, these are both F1s. They're both the kids from the first part, and we're crossing them with each other. So getting back to our steps, legend. We're talking about the same kind of pea plants, so the same legend will still work here. Parents' phenotypes, got them. They're both F1 generation, and we know that every single one of those plants has to be big R, little r, and produce round peas. And now when these cross, we need to make a new Punnett square. In part one, we saw there was a simpler way to do this Punnett square, but this one is actually going to have a lot of variety, because... The dad plant can produce big R and little r gametes, and so can the mom. So we really do need a 2 by 2 square for this. From dad, we can get big R or little r. From mom, we can get big R or little r. And so there are going to be four different outcomes here. Well, three different outcomes you'll see in a second. Step three was the Punnett square on the parent's gametes. Check, we just did that. Step four, combine the gametes meaning what combination do we get here? This was big R from one parent, big R from the other one, so the kid is big R, big R. In this cell we get big R from one, little r from the other. In this cell, little r from one, big R from the other, but remember, dominant first, doesn't matter which parent it came from. And here, little r, little r. So there's our offspring, and what do those mean? Big R, big R, according to our legend, is round pea plants. It's the round allele twice. This is the round and the wrinkled, but the round is dominant, so round again. Round and wrinkled, dominant wins. And little r, little r is wrinkled and wrinkled again. 
bring cold. Okay, so that's all the information about the offspring, and now we just count up. For our phenotypic ratios, we have one, two, three round to just one wrinkled. Or I'll do it in a minute. I was going to get, I was going to talk about percentages, and I will. But let's get the basic version done first. For genotypic ratios, the there are three different ones: big R, big R, one, big R, big R, two. There's two ways to be big R, little R. Two, one way to be little R, little R. So you can write the ratio like that. Or the other thing you can do. Is, per, is percentages for each of these. Out of the four offspring, three are round. On the calculator, you can do three out of four times 100% here and get that 75% of the offspring are round. And then if you do one out of four times 100%, that'll tell you that 25% of the offspring are wrinkled. So, you can, with the fractions, three quarters to one quarter, or with the percentages, 75 to 25. For the genotype, if we do percentages, it would be one out of four, big R, big R. Comes out to 25%. Two out of four is 50%. So we get 50% big R, little r, or 50% heterozygous. And one out of four is 25% again. For little r, little r. When you're done, you can add up your percentages. 75 plus 25, that makes 100. 25 plus 50 plus 25 also makes 100. If your total doesn't add up to 100, then something has probably gone wrong. If you do get 100, things are looking good. So, these parents here, remember, these were from the F1 generation. And the offspring here, and there's a great variety of them, this whole mix of plants here, all of them would be what we call the F2 generation. And the genotype and phenotype ratios for the F2 generation is what they were asking for, so we have succeeded.